So I'm going to talk about the sweep of history, if you will, um, in analytics and how they're used within organizations. And I won't spend, you know, if you're not interested in history, you don't have to leave. I won't spend a huge amount of time on the ancient stuff. Uh, the fact is, the ancient stuff is still with us in many ways, and so still useful, I think, to address how we can get better at the original ways that we did analytics within organizations. And so um, that uh, sweep of history is represented, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's a four-era model. Um, starting with artisanal analytics, which certainly, um, when I was a um, graduate student, I got involved in uh, social science computing. I sort of paid my way through through graduate school that way, across the river from here. And um, certainly artisanal analytics were what we did then. Um, I'll say more about them, uh, all of these, in a second. Um, Around 2000 or so, um, you started to see people um, talking about a new way of doing analytics, which were um, highly related to the um, technologies that were changing. So I kind of call that big data analytics. And then um, around 2012 or 13 or so, I started to notice that this big data phenomenon had gone well outside of Silicon Valley, that large organizations were doing this too, and I call that data economy analytics, a little bit different from the pure big data stuff. And now, um, I sort of spent much of my career going around talking to people about analytics, um, unless it is a um, relatively backward country in this world. Nobody wants me to talk about analytics anymore. It's all about AI. So I will spend the bulk of uh, my time talking about um, AI with you this morning. And I, you can stop me at any time, but I will leave some time at the end for, for questions. Um, so artisanal analytics, you sort of think of the analytical equivalent of uh, um, somebody in Portland, Oregon, doing, um, I don't know, creating uh, very high-priced uh, lamps, say. Um, everything is artisanal in, in Portland. Maybe in Portland, Maine as well, but not quite as much as in Portland, Oregon. Um, and artisanal analytics uh, have the, these attributes of, of um, artisanry, they are slow and expensive and handcrafted and uh, labor intensive, all, all done by humans. The human sort of decides, looks at the data, puzzles over it for a while, decides what kind of analysis to do, um, does the analysis, presents it to the decision maker, the decision maker says, no, that wasn't quite what I had in mind, and you know, iterate over and over again. Um, so this process can take several months. Um, for the most part, the analysts of artisanal analytics are um, not sitting at the right hand of the decision maker, but at some remove within the organization. Tend to be a sort of back office phenomenon. And um, uh, they also um, tend to do mostly descriptive analytics, not exclusively. You know, uh, in the early days of analytics, people also did some predictive models, but they were a small fraction of the total. Um, and now I would say, still, the bulk of um, artisanal analytics are descriptive, and uh, we probably changed less in, in that regard in descriptive analytics. You know, we still have to have people looking at their Excel spreadsheets and looking at their bar charts and saying, you know, what do I, what do I make of this of this data? Um, now, as I said, even though this um, type of analytics is still around, the world has changed a lot, and there are some technologies that people are using to speed up artisanal analytics. Um, uh, Self-service 
um, helps a lot. We decide that if I'm a trained analytics professional, I shouldn't be doing this stuff. I should be having um, business analysts do it within the organization. So um, it's been democratized to a large degree. We have people doing mobile user interfaces. We have lots and lots of visual analytics. Um, just in general, um, this area continues to evolve. And I'll say something at the end about some new technologies that may um, change um, this type of analytics dramatically, but I wouldn't say they have yet. Um, so, as I said, around the turn of the century, you started to see people, mostly in Silicon Valley, people started to say, okay, I have all this, you know, um, streaming, click stream data um, from web analytics and so on, and all e-commerce, and I need a new way to deal with that kind of stuff. And um, driven not so much by changes in analytics, the analytics were not terribly sophisticated in this era, but the technologies were, and um, this was the era of uh, when Hadoop, Pig, Hive, Python, etc. were developed, and so in order to deal with these kinds of new technologies, we needed a new type of person, and we called, ended up calling that person a data scientist. Now, I was very interested in these people. I um, did, I think, one of the first research projects on them. I, I interviewed 35 of them to find out sort of what they did. Um, I had been doing analytics work for a while. I sort of made a mistake of saying, yeah, you know, this big data stuff, it's just um, analytics by another name. Of course, it was largely related to analytics, but there were some substantial differences. And so I ended up, um, I didn't know that many of these people on the West Coast, so I found somebody on the West Coast to collaborate with me on the project. It turns out, um, he was a fun guy to work with. He didn't actually do any interviewing or any writing, but he um, would make um, statements to me occasionally. Um, and I, it was a good choice. He was, at the time, working for LinkedIn, and then he went to a venture capital firm, and he started a company that was acquired by Salesforce, and then he went to work for a much larger organization. This guy's name was DJ Patil. Have any of you heard of DJ Patil? Um, who's DJ Patil? Uh, yeah, Chief Analytics Officer um, of the United States of America, the first and only. Um, uh, I think that job is still open if anybody would like to pursue it, although I'm not sure it's going to be filled in the current administration. Um, uh, doesn't seem to be a terribly data-oriented decision process going on down there, but that's, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so, um, DJ used to say, you know, these data scientists are different, um, they don't want to be in the back office, they he kept telling me they want to be on the bridge, man, and I'd say, yeah, yeah, and then we were writing this article, and I said, you know, what do you mean by this on the bridge phrase? He said, you know, right up here with Captain Kirk. Um, I said, okay, I get it. He's a, he's a Trekkie. Um, uh, and he's the one who told me that uh, the analytics were not terribly sophisticated. Big data often equals small math, he used to say, which um, I, I found to be the case. Um, but the other thing that really was different is in artisanal analytics, era one, the focus was uh, on um, the objective of the whole activity was on decision support, if you will. And in fact, I started my consulting career, of, of, again, across the river in Kendall Square, working for an organization that did a lot of decision support for executives, kind of how do we use analytics and data and so on to make better internal decisions. DJ said, nah, we're not interested in that. None of the people I interviewed said, supporting managers' decisions with data analysis, man, that's the dead zone. <laughs> uh, I said, well, what do you do instead? He said, well, you know, we, we develop products, we develop things that customers use, at least, you know, interesting, um, demos and features in products, so a very different idea of what the objective of analytics were in this um, new era. So, you know, that era is still going on. I think some of the more sophisticated companies have 
move to area three, even the ones, you know, the Silicon Valley online firms. But um, even if you don't necessarily want to emulate that model, we can learn a lot from it, I think, in terms of its objectives and, and tools and so on. Um, okay, so um, era three, as I said, only a few years ago, the eras are accelerating, was this, I call it the data economy era, era where basically every kind of company said, you know, yeah, we're a data company. Yeah, we're interested in using data to not just support, but drive our strategies. Um, we're interested in these new technologies um, as well. Um, are we still using small data? Absolutely. You know, nobody likes to call it small data. Nobody last night at the, at the cocktail party, uh, supposedly a VIP cocktail party, but I think per pretty much everybody at the conference was invited. Anyway, uh, uh, nobody said, oh, hi, you know, I'm, I'm Sally. I work with small data at my company. Uh, nobody ever says that, but small data is still really important stuff. You know, what your customers buy from you and what your patients um, do in your electronic health record system in, in a hospital. That's all relatively small data, relatively easy to manage, but um, still quite important. But now people want to combine it with uh, big data. You know, if I'm uh, looking at what a customer has bought from me, I want to combine that with what the customer says online and social media. If I'm looking at an electronic health record, yeah, that's great, but I like to combine it with some uh, genomic data or some proteomic data or some sensor data from their their activity tracker, all those kinds of things. So we want big data plus small data in this era. Um, we um, are still doing decision support uh, in this era, but it's no longer artisanal. It's become industrialized. Uh, I'll say more about that in a second. Um, and in this era, everybody starts to get interested in data as a product or service, not just the online firms in Silicon Valley. Basically, all kinds of companies say, yeah, we think we can create new products and services based on data and analytics. So um, kind of a combined set of objectives. So um, this uh, slide shows these kind of two different goals. The, um, products and services, I refer to them as data products, but I don't think there's any widely accepted name. You, you have um, lots of organizations like Monsanto slash Bayer now um, doing precision agriculture products, um, telling farmers when to plant, how much to plant, uh, how much to water, when to harvest, etc., and getting higher crop yields as a result. Um, you have organizations like um, what, uh, GE. Our, um, we were really happy when GE came to Boston for their headquarters, but now we're not so happy anymore. Uh, anyway, um, uh, GE, I think, leading at the time, at least, in this idea of predictive asset maintenance and you know putting sensors. I'll say, say more about them in a second. Or putting sensors into things that, that spin around, like gas turbines and so on. And then you have um, industrialized decision support objectives. So the picture that I have is of a UPS person. I think that the UPS Orion project um, is still <laughs> one of the world's largest, if not the largest, analytics project. Um, uh, I once, I did a moderate amount of work with UPS on this project, and they, some reporter from the Wall Street Journal once asked me, well, how much did this thing cost? And they never told me, they were fairly secretive about it, but I kind of added up what it seemed like it might cost, and I said 450 million, um, and the UPS people said, not a bad guess. They, they wouldn't tell me exactly how close I was, but they said, pretty good guess. Um, so, when you start talking about $450 million analytics projects, that's fairly substantial, you know? Um, that's pretty close to half a billion. Anytime you use that billion dollar uh, 
A metric that tends to be fairly big projects. So, um, and it's, if you are not familiar with it, it's a project for basically telling drivers on a more or less real-time basis what their route should be instead of having the driver drive the same route every day, which is how UPS did it for 100 years. It was um, an industrialized, I think the model it printed out came to about 37 pages, an industrialized approach to you know, telling people where to go next based on what packages came in, and pretty soon also the weather and the traffic and, and all those sorts of things. So um, uh, company, I was doing some work with Cisco Systems and um, the, the guy who did this work was in Miami. I think he may have been the only Cisco employee in Miami. I'd be, visit with him occasionally and he'd say, yeah, you know, we're doing this propensity modeling to help our sales force figure out where to go to, you know, be more successful in their selling, which, you know, which customers, which buyers. And he said, you know, it's a complex world, so we've got 10 different models. And then I'd visit him a year later and he said, we're up to 100 different models now. Um, and the number would grow and grow. The last time I talked to him, he said, yeah, we have 30,000 models that we create every quarter. Um, not an artisanal process to have 30,000 models anymore. In fact, you can only do it with um, some pretty um, sophisticated approaches to machine learning. Um, so we're kind of starting to verge into um, analytics 4.0 here. So, um, some quick examples, I think P&G, probably the single best example of anal analytics 3.0 for internal operations, internal decision making with, um, and you go over to World Shaving Headquarters at Gillette, um, uh, they have had these rooms, I don't know if they still use them anymore, they're kind of starting to phase them out, these rooms where Managers would get together all around the world, same data, same an analyses, a smart embedded analyst who would help the decision makers, you know, figure out what the data meant and what further analytics to do on it and so on. And they had, you couldn't get into one of those rooms, they had these um, uh, environments where you could um, look at it on your desktop, uh, which they called decision cockpits. They had um, real-time consumer media sentiment in a consumer pulse environment. Um, uh, close to 200 embedded analysts um, who were at the right hand of decision makers scattered all around the world, but still centrally um, managed. Um, but even at, at P&G, they're starting to move in this 4.0 direction. Um, anybody try the Olay skin analyzer? For example, um, uh, it's unlikely that you men would be interested, but apparently you women are not worried either about your real skin age, because that's what the Olay Skin Analyzer tells you. <laughs> My wife said, I would never look at that thing, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I'm trying to get her to use it because I was trying to work with P&G on how we think about AI. And, I'm trying to get her to be my test subject. She said, forget about it. Now. I, don't, I don't want to know my real skin age. But the idea is you take a selfie and deep learning analyzes your real skin age and tells you what Olay products could presumably reduce your real skin age. Um, and they did lots of uh, propensity modeling, machine learning for where should we do promotions and how should we... Um, help salespeople to sell more effectively and so on. Um, so pretty good, I think, you know, a certain period in time, um, they are starting to, to move to a new era. Then you have GE, which was great in this era at putting, as I said, all these sensor devices into um, gas turbines and jet engines and MRI machines and all the various things that they made and then creating digital twins of that data and analyzing it and figuring out, oh, this is about to break, we've got to service it. Um, but um, one of the challenges, I think, with this sort of leading edge technology, at least leading edge for manufacturing, is that customers aren't necessarily ready to do a lot of these things. I, I, 
did some work with GE in Latin America, and the Latin American GE people said, you know, this stuff is great, but our customers just really aren't interested. And GE said, well, we want to take over the process of monitoring your engine data. Well, the problem is Boeing also, and, and Airbus also wanted to manage that engine data, and American Airlines and Delta and so on wanted to manage that engine data and do their own predictive asset maintenance on it. So it's a kind of a crowded territory um, and turns out not something that GE could make a lot of money on quickly, um, which might explain why their stock price has been in the toilet for now four or five years. So it's actually not related to their digital investment so much. It's the other businesses that the digital results couldn't, you know, paper over. Anyway, good idea, but you know, maybe not, um, maybe not something that needed to be done quite as quickly and extensively as, as it was. Um, okay, so we're um, entering the present, more or less. As I said, nobody wants to hear about analytics anymore. They only want to hear about AI. So what characterizes this period? Um, well, you know, uh, how many of you know the dirty secret? of artificial intelligence that it's mostly analytics. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't want to burst your bubble if you thought that it was a completely new thing. Uh, particularly machine learning um, is mostly the same thing as predictive analytics. But anyway, you know, we call it machine learning now, something that, that we have to do. Um, you have to kind of move with the time. Just We had to call it big data for a while. And, you know, nobody wants to use that term anymore. So. Um, uh, a lot of it's based on analytics, but there is um, definitely more automation going on, and we're thinking how this relates to people's jobs, and we are um, putting it in quite sophisticated product settings like autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, autonomous vehicles have been um, just around the corner since, I think I've been studying them since the mid-80s or so, coming any day now to a street near you. Um, but, you know, eventually I do think it's going to, going to happen. Um, but um, we start to worry about, well, what does this do to human jobs? And um, my take is always, it's more about augmentation than large-scale automation, but um, I'll say more about that in a little while. Um, but the bad news for all of you who are in the analytics slash data science slash AI profession is that none of those previous skills accumulated for previous eras go away. Um, you know, if in era one, you needed to know things like, you know, how do I integrate data? How do I clean it up? Sadly, that's the other dirty secret of all of these eras. Most of your time is going to be spent on data preparation. Um, Things are starting to change slowly in that regard, but still, still true. Um, uh, a lot of importance put on communications and, and being able to tell a good story with data. That never goes away. And then we get into big data where we start dealing with um, large-scale data restructuring and things like you know, open source coding. And if we're going to do data products, we probably need to do something about product development. So all that gets thrown on top, but um, never goes away. And we develop new technologies and new ways of working with our customers and so on, just gets added to the mix. So it's a tough job, and I think um, I, I got a, a message from our provost this morning at Babson. We have a new president at Babson who's quite interested in analytics now, which you know, we're a school that focuses on entrepreneurship, so sometimes Analytics um, are a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but many entrepreneurs prefer their gut to analytics. But our new president, who was um, uh, an entrepreneur himself and has a PhD in kind of entrepreneurship related issues, very gung ho about analytics, our professor said, Well, what should we teach people? And they, you know, the problem is things change so fast. Um, so, what I proposed is that I have a hard time pronouncing this word. We have an approach to guided autodidacticism. Um, <laughs> auto, an autodidact is someone who teaches themselves without benefit of any human instructor. 
That's a bit of a problem for universities because if there's no human instructor, no jobs for people like me, no money coming in for tuition. So we're thinking, how can we guide students, particularly in analytics and data science and so on, to figure out what they need to know um, and what are the places they can learn it and then to kind of assess how well they did that. So to sort of lead them through the uh, um, process of being an autodidact. So we'll see. We'll see how that turns out. Um, so, uh, despite these four areas, there are clearly some, some trends that we can identify. In terms of organizational structure, when I first started working with companies on analytics, everything was very dispersed around the organization with no central coordination at all at most of them. Um, over time, I would hear more and more companies saying, oh, we formed a central analytics group. It's, Great, you know, we can coordinate things much better. Um, P&G is a good example. They were very distributed, and then they said, okay, we're going to have a central analytics group. We're going to have a report to IT, which might not have been great in every company, but worked out pretty well at P&G. They had a very visionary chief information officer. Um, but then, you know, if you were in world shaping headquarters doing... Um, data analysis for the senior management team, they started to say, well, we kind of like to have this person reporting to us. They're doing a great job. We're grateful to you for giving, or you know, they, they had to pay for them, but um, for letting them work with us, but we want them on our team, not your team, or at least as the primary reporting relationship. And more and more, I think, as companies get more sophisticated with analytics, it's a dispersed but centrally coordinated kind of activity. So that's one trend. Another is that more and more of the traditional analytics work is done by machines. So in the artisanal period, as I said when I you was know, working my way through graduate school, the reason people were willing to pay me um, moderately big bucks is I could look at what kind of data they had and say, yeah, you know, that's a that's just a you know logistic regression, or it's a cross tabulation, or it's a an analysis of variance, or whatever. Um, and uh, you know that knowledge of what algorithm applied was worth something. But now a machine can do all that stuff for us. Um, I'll say more about this later on. But I think this automated machine learning um, capability that more and more companies have. We have a Good company in Boston um, that does this, Data Robot. I have a little bit of stock in them. I'm hoping it will buy me something between a really nice dinner and a small car if they would have a liquidity event. But um, just to fully disclose, but I think that's going to change things. And what it might mean is that we have more time and energy left for thinking about how is this really changing the business. If it becomes that easy to create a model, then the job of the data scientist or the professional analyst is no longer to create a model, never really should have been the job. The job is how do we create business change with data and analytics? And if one part gets easier, maybe that gives us a little more time to focus on building relationships and establishing trust and understanding the business process and so on. I'm not sure, because frankly, you know, a lot of a lot of data scientist types aren't that interested in building relationships with carbon-based life forms, <laughs> uh, but some are, and I think you know they'll they'll do better in this process. Um, the, the software and hardware get cheaper all the time, and people get more expensive. So that seems to be a trend over over the years. You know, open source software is free. The hardware is um, uh, getting cheaper and cheaper, particularly in the cloud, but the people um, not so much. Maybe that also will change with automation of, of some of these processes. Data, more and more external, more and more companies that I work with say, yeah, I have all this internal data, but I really need to look at what's available in the outside world to start predicting demand and things like that. So that's definitely a trend. And then um, the, the thing that hasn't changed so much is that the majority of time is spent on data cleaning and preparation and integration, but um, AI is starting to change that as well. And again, um, we have a startup in Harvard Square called Tamer. Um, their chief scientist is Mike Stonebreaker, a big database developer who 
couple of years ago won the Turing Award, the computer science equivalent of the Nobel Prize, and um, uh, they do automated data integration through machine learning, kind of probabilistic matching across different databases. To my mind, far better than master data management as a way to integrate data. Um, so look up Mike Stonebreaker's work if you, if you want to learn more about that. So those are some of the, the trends that are, are taking place across era. Um, 4.0, we say it's about a technology called artificial intelligence, but it's not really a technology. It's a bunch of technologies. Um, maybe someday they'll all be combined, but now it's pretty important to know which technology does what and how how might we use it for a particular uh, business problem. Um, machine learning is the most common, but it's kind of a catch-all category, 63%, and this is the white survey that I worked with them on, said they were using it um, in the survey last year, going up um, compared to the previous year. 50% using deep learning, which is a form of machine learning, of course, that's way up. 62% um, some form of natural language processing. The, our categories aren't very clear. That could also be a machine learning based technology, or it could be a um, something based on semantics and knowledge graph and so on. So depending on the application, you use different underlying technologies. And 49% using robotic process automation. That was actually down a bit, but I don't think it's reflective of real life. If you look at the the um, Revenues and the stock prices of the robotic process automation companies just really zooming through the roof. Um, uh, I think UiPath was up 5,000% in revenues in um, two or three years, so just really um, doing hugely well. Um, so what are people trying to do? I think the key message is a lot of product-related stuff. Um, that's the highest category, embedding AI into products. Not so much in the way of automation, of um, getting rid of jobs, interestingly enough. So most of the press talks about how AI will eliminate jobs. Um, however, if you ask companies what they're doing, you know, they could be lying about it. And I think there is some of that going on, frankly, a conspiracy of silence, if you will, about job loss, but um, a lot of interest in other areas as well. Um, so, some quick examples, Vanguard, one big application of AI for robo-advice, works really well, not terribly sophisticated in terms of AI, but um, growing far faster than any other um, robo-advisor capability, I think in part because there's a human component as well. Um, the, the ones like Wealthfront that are just um, machine robo, not growing nearly as fast. Vanguard's up to, um, what does that say, 115 billion under management. Still small compared to their overall assets under management are growing, growing rapidly. You have a company like Pfizer, one of the bigger, um, one of the more aggressive pharmaceutical firms doing um, 150 or so AI projects. They were working with IBM Watson to try to identify new drugs. Um, this is one of the many areas where Watson didn't work out all that well. So um, they pretty much abandoned that. Then you have a company like Capital One that says they have over a thousand AI projects. Capital One, you may know, was one of the most aggressive analytics companies. When I started doing research on analytics um, more than a decade ago, they were one of my poster children for doing this really well. And now they're doing it with, um, with AI as well. A little bit of data security challenges, um, as you may have heard, but it's kind of embarrassing because I just wrote a piece about Capital One, a lot of different interviews with them and so on, um, put it up on Forbes and LinkedIn and everything um, right before the big data breach. It was really well timed on my part. And of course, they, they told me to put in the article, oh, we spent a lot of time and energy protecting our data. Okay, right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, the, my other point, and then I'll stop, is that this is not a moonshot related technology yet. The organizations that have tried to do moonshots have not done terribly well. So, it's the famous MD Anderson Cancer Center. 
um, episode where they spent $62 million and got virtually nothing to show for it. The University of Texas auditors that, that run um, MD Anderson said, we're putting the kibosh on this system. No patients treated, no integration with their electronic medical record system, just uh, uh, pretty much a total failure. But at MD Anderson, there were other smaller, less ambitious projects that worked out quite well. And you said, well, you know, maybe they don't understand technology well enough. Look at somebody like Amazon. Amazon does do moonshots. Moon they tend to take longer and cost more than anybody anticipated. Uh, anybody shop at Amazon Go stores yet? Um, there are you know, 13 of them around the U.S. Um, I try in every one I go into to shoplift. It never works. Um, uh, they figured that out apparently, but it was really expensive. And at first, I gather you could shoplift. Those were the days. But um, uh, uh, anybody getting package delivery by drone yet from Amazon? I don't know. They haven't appeared on my doorstep, but. Bezo said it's coming in 2018, so it uh, must be here. Uh, I just haven't seen them. But, um, but even at Amazon, one of the most technologically sophisticated organizations the world has ever known, Bezos has said the vast bulk of what we do with machine learning is, quote, quietly but meaningfully improving core operations. Um, so I will leave you with the idea that AI is not an exponential technology. It is a linear technology that's getting better all the time. It's not going to revolutionize life as we know, know it. It's going to evolutionize life as we know it. Um, it is, in a way, not a terribly exciting technology. It is a boring technology, or at least what's really working now is boring AI. Um, but I think over time, it will have a revolutionary impact. Um, there's a guy named Roy Amara who coined something called Amara's Law. He said, you know, technologies tend to be um, overestimated in their impact over the short run and underestimated in their impact over the long run. And that, my friends, is what I think is going to happen with artificial intelligence. So um, be patient is the watchword. Thanks very much. Happy to answer any questions or comments here. Hey, Tom, thank you. Um, Do you want to talk about that issue of automated machine learning? Now I know why you like the end of robot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so when you, when you talk to... Now I know why you don't like it, because you're a data scientist with a PhD in astrophysics. astrophysics. They never like these automated I, I actually do. I, I use them in my operations. But what, when you talk to key stakeholders at the sea level, uh, what do you think that their approach is to the cultural transformation that has to happen in order for AI to reach their full potential? We see... Uh, companies like Novartis that change their CEO with, with a young guy who goes very aggressively about changing their culture in order to make AI an integral part of the drug discovery process. Whereas you see the majority of the companies, potentially Pfizer and some others as well, they still keep old style conservative approach to operations and still expect AI to deliver right away. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure I agree with um, the Pfizer characterization because they are somewhat conservative about the drug development process, but you, you've worked in that industry, you, you know better than I. Drug development is not what Pfizer is about anymore. You know, they buy that capability, yeah. um, but they are quite focused on using it in the sales process and so on, which is where their real advantage is. Frankly, I think all of these big companies are having a tough time with that, and if you look in as my, I don't like dabble in that industry, but if you look at that industry as well as some other ones, the ones that are really shaking things up are startups, you know, that start from the beginning with vast amounts of data and thinking all that really matters is how we use machine learning and so on to analyze this data and find, you know, compounds that might work under certain circumstances. Certainly you see that in financial services where you have all these fintechs that are being really aggressive. You have some companies like J.P. Morgan Chase that say, 
well, we don't want to be eaten alive by these people. We're spending $5 billion a year researching AI. That's pretty, pretty rare, I think. I don't know if you have any comments on this issue. Can large companies really make it? I mean, if, if, if they go through the cultural transformation process, I think uh, they have an advantage over startups. They own the data. Uh, whereas the startups, as you said, they're very agile, they go after. But now we see a marriage between the uh, larger companies buying startups for their know-how. But the larger companies, if they do it right, I think they are at, a, at, at an advantage. But the cultural transformation piece is still missing. Yeah. Um, you know, we, um, you and I were talking about um, this guy, Gary Loveman, who was one of my analytical heroes. He ran, he was a Harvard Business School professor, ended up running... Um, Caesars, making it very analytical. Um, uh, then he left there as CEO and went to Aetna, um, where he worked, I believe, for a while and was starting up a new business unit. He said, no way that organization could change fast enough. He said, the best thing I ever did at Aetna was to tell them to let themselves be bought by CBS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now he's got a startup to do it, and you're working in a startup. So I think um, a lot of the change is coming in that, in that domain. One last question, and then I'll hang it up for the day and let you go out on the ship. Way back in the back. Yeah, so we, we were talking about that, Sean and I were talking about that earlier. Um, uh, a lot of the schools have had to um, start to hire people from industry to make them adjuncts or you know lecturers or whatever just because so many of the skills are new and existing faculty, I think, are slow to, you know, learn them. Um, so, I, you know, I think it might end up um, being a, kind of a new model of how we think about, how we think about faculty. And when I was a professor here at BU, um, they, when I was hired, I was told um, I could have tenure but um, if I wanted to, I could take a 10-year contract and get, I think it's like 15% more salary a year. Um, and it took me like two seconds to take a 15% more salary deal. So I hope that we'll move to a model where, um, you know, we have ways to motivate people to continually refresh their skills or otherwise we just won't be relevant to, to students anymore. On that happy note, uh, <laughs> nice talking to all of you. Thank you.